Welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals, where we break down crypto projects and learn about the drivers behind the data you see on our charts. Today, I'm joined by Hazard from Rook, a decentralized payment for order flow protocol. Hey Hazard, welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals. It's great to have you on. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. Could you start us off with giving just a quick intro to Rook for those not yet familiar? Sure. So. Rook, the Rook DAO, is a collective dedicated to uh, developing uh, the Rook protocol, which is a uh, DeFi protocol that allows users and builders of applications to essentially own their order flow or uh, their transaction flow, if you want to think about it that way. And what this means is that as you use a blockchain by sending orders or transactions to the blockchain, um, you can create something called MEV. And many people are familiar with MEV. It's essentially some form of surplus value, some excess value that your transactions sort of have um, that uh, as a result of how you trade and how that trade is settled. So this MEV typically will uh, accrue to the producers of the blocks on the blockchain as a result of their power over uh, the order in which the transactions go into those blocks, which is how that MEV, that value, can be extracted. And what our protocol does is it actually allows that extraction to happen not with the block producers, but actually on behalf of the users and the applications that create these transactions that create the MEV. So essentially, it's a way for you as a user or as a builder of an application to own this value that comes along with your order flow and use it to do things like uh, monetize an application or earn extra money on your trades or on your other blockchain interactions or just to prevent harmful MEV like sandwich attacks and front running from harming you as well. So it's a system that allows you to own your order flow and develop this value from the order flow that would have gone to block producers uh, if the system like this, a system like the Rook protocol wasn't wasn't here working for you. Great overview of both Rook and uh, MEV. It would be great to break down your business model so that we understand how cash flows both through the protocol to supply side participants and how you are capturing that value as revenue that accrues to the protocol. Sure. So you can think of what we do almost as a form of payment for order flow. Think of the user and as somebody who is going to send their transaction, not directly to the blockchain, but they're going to offer it to a huge network of keepers of these bots. And they're going to say, who would like to settle my transaction? I will give to the highest bidder the exclusive right, exclusive, so only this bot that wins this auction will be able to settle this transaction. And what happens is there's a, there's a, a just-in-time auction that occurs among these bots for the right to settle this order. These keepers, they can simulate the blockchain so they can know how valuable your order is. So say you wanted to sell, a, you know, I don't know, a ton of Ether on, on Uniswap or something, and it's going to create some kind of price imbalance on that pool versus uh, the sushi pool. And this keeper knows, well, if I can settle their transaction along with an arbitrage of the sushi pool and the uni pool, well, then I can make some additional profit. So I want to be the one to settle their transaction because that means I'll be the one that can make this arbitrage profit. In doing that, they need to pay for the right to be the one to execute that. And so that payment is going to happen through the Rook protocol. The Rook protocol is what facilitates these auctions for the order flow that's coming from users and applications. So payment for order flow is a really scary word because, you know, in traditional finance, typically what happens is you sign an agreement that says, we'll pay you this much money for your order flow and don't worry about how much we're making from it. Who knows how much it is? It might be 10 times what we're paying you for it, not your problem, right? We don't do that in DeFi and we can't do that in DeFi because that would centralize the network if we were able to siphon off that much value. So we actually look at the way that we work with payment for order flow as a public good. We want to provide a public good so that you or any application can start to earn the fair value from their order flow as if they were kind of Robin Hood making an agreement with Citadel, making an agreement with the very best settlement agents on the blockchain, these bots. Anybody can use it 
and start earning money just by doing what they would normally do on the blockchain. And so in that model, what we actually aspire to is to pass as much of this MEV that gets discovered back to the users and to the applications that create those orders. And so the way that uh, you know value flows through the system is that essentially each order initiates an auction among a network of bots who are then going to bid for the right, the exclusive right to execute that order. The winning bid is then paid to the protocol and the protocol divides that bid in various ways. And the vast, vast majority of that bid, 80% or more of it is going to go to the user who originated the transaction. And we actually aspire to push that even higher so that the user is getting the absolute maximum amount that's possible. And the only thing that's left is what they need to pay to the winning keeper to kind of incentivize them to actually settle the trade. So you can think of it as almost a settlement fee that's paid to the keeper. And then however much is necessary to operate this public good protocol, right? But all of this isn't payment coming out of their pocket. This is all paid for using the additional value in their orders. So to the user, their orders are suddenly free. They don't pay gas. They don't have to worry about slippage. They don't have to worry about liquidity fees. Uh, they don't have to worry about MEV. Everything is free. And then they're going to get additional value on top of that as a result of this MEV that their orders develop. And from that surplus is where all of these little costs are taken out. And so that's our aspiration is to ensure that the vast majority, as much as possible of this value is actually passed back to the user through the protocol. And this is all protocolized and managed by a DAO. It's not sort of an agreement that we sign and say, yeah, sure, you know, we promise we'll do this and this. It's all transparent and it's all completely verifiable on chain. And so it's really interesting. It's a really, uh, it's a different approach to payment for order flow than you'd ever see in something like traditional finance. On kind of that note of value throwing the protocol, what would you say are the current drivers or challenges related to your growth? This is a great question. And we had to contemplate this too, because if you look around at what the work that's been done on MEV, most of it's been done at what you might call the consensus layer or the settlement layer. It's done with you know mining software. Well, what about users and applications? They are making the MEV. So don't they deserve the MEV that they make? Because today they don't get any of it, right? It, it all goes to the, to the miners or to the validators, right? Once the merge happens. Why is that? Why has nobody addressed the issue at the application layer to give users and applications this MEV back? And the reason is every application is different. Every protocol is different. Every smart contract is different, different wallets, different users and things that users do. All of these differences create a very challenging environment to uh, create solutions for. It's hard to have a one size fits all solution, but we know that it's possible and we know that it's necessary. It's necessary in order to create a competitive uh, piece of technology that everybody's going to be able to use and prosper by using. So we're committed to working in what we kind of call the, the jungle side of the blockchain, which is all of these applications that are very different from each other, right? And to build primitives that allow these applications over time to begin to integrate with the Rook protocol so that they can begin to develop these cash flows for themselves. These cash flows that we know belong to them to begin with, right? And are just the result of their normal activity on the blockchain. And really the barrier to growth there is education because for you know the last few years that everybody's been learning about MEV, nobody has been talking about the fact about where does the MEV come from? And you know, we hear that, you know, oh, a billion dollars of MEV have, has gone to miners this year. Well, where is that coming from? It's not coming out of thin air. It's actually coming out of users' pockets, applications' pockets, out of their liquidity pools, their liquidity providers. This is inefficiency in the blockchain. It's leaking out. And this is not something that's commonly understood. And that's something that we have to overcome. We have to overcome this idea that the MEV is just kind of here and around. And once people understand that, and many developers are very aware of this, but not so many users. Once people understand that they kind of have a claim on this value, then they're much more interested in, well, oh, what do you mean? Oh, I can get it back. You know, if I use this protocol, I can actually get that value back. And so we're committed to making it so that they're aware of this fact and that they have a good experience using the protocol so that they can see that, you know, it's, it's, it's really true. You know, they can monetize in a way that's responsible for the network and for their users. 
and in a way that isn't taking from anybody else's, you know, uh, it's not eating anybody else's lunch. This is value that belonged to them to begin with. And it actually makes our blockchains stronger and our markets more efficient if they're able to capture this value. Now, I'd love to hear what the purpose of the Rook token is. So the Rook token is essentially how we um, represent MEV in the system. So I said that keepers are going to bid on users' orders for the right to execute those orders. So the uh, thing they're using to bid in that auction is the Rook token. And so users are being provided with the Rook token and the uh, protocol is uh, splitting up the uh, proceeds of this auction from uh, in, in units of Rook token and providing them to the various um, places that the protocol uh, has uh, said that they should go, including the user, um, the protocol's uh, treasury, some of it is burned, um, and keepers purchase this Rook at the, on the open market and then they stake it into a uh, staking contract and from that staking pool, they can use those funds to bid through these auctions. So it's essentially the unit of account for keepers who are bidding for the right to settle these. So you can think of it as sort of a unit of MEV. It's, it's used like that. It's also used as a, um, as a governance token to you know, direct uh, the operations and decision-making in the Rook DAO. Sure. And, and you mentioned uh, staking. So is X Rook a uh, staked version of Rook? Right. So we have two forms of staking. One is that keepers are going to use the Rook and they're going to stake it for the purpose of bidding. And then we also have kind of a public form of staking where members of the Rook DAO, people who own Rook, can stake that Rook into a staking contract to receive X Rook. And they will receive a, um, a, a pro rata portion of this, this bid that you can think of as sort of the protocol revenue. This is an adjustable portion via DAO governance and so on but they essentially will receive a small um, portion of that for in, in return for staking the token. And staking gives them certain governance rights and so on. This is really interesting because, you know, Rook is actually def a deflationary token. So we don't have um, any token emissions right now. Uh, we don't have any plans to have them either. And so what it basically gives you if you stake Rook is um, it gives you a, uh, a stake in the governance of this DAO and its uh protocol. And as these protocols grow, because of the fact that the uh, uh, the rook that passes through the protocol, some of it is, is burned, you essentially have a, a non-diluting uh, stake in the growth of this protocol. You mentioned the protocol treasury, and I wanted to dive into that because if we look at your treasury composition chart, it is um, very nicely diversified compared to most DeFi protocols who hold the bulk in their own token. Uh, but you have it split into quite a few. So I would love to hear your thinking behind this. And do you have a specific treasury management strategy in, in place? We do. And we are very proud of our treasury and of the way that it's been managed. You know, this is sort of the long term fund that's going to ensure that the protocol can be developed to a level where, you know, um, network effects are taking over and it's able to create this self sustaining ecosystem, right, that it aspires to. And so, Yes, we've had, we have a, a wonderful treasury um, management group at the DAO, and we've had a lot of great community participation on treasury matters. We have a weekly treasury call that's open to the public that you can join our Discord and check out. And um, yes, we very deliberately you know, emphasize risk-minimized assets and also management-minimized assets because we sort of recognize that DAOs are not ideal for you know, agile management of kind of like hair trigger positions and, and high risk complex instruments and things like that. And so we actually don't really use the treasury to chase yield or as a vehicle for complex investments. It's, it's really a long-term fund that we want to keep aligned with, you know, general ecosystem narratives. Like, you know, we hold a lot of ether. Um, we hold a lot of stable coins that are diversified in various ways. And, um, you know, we are probably going to transition. We've had some recent proposals to transition um, uh, some of that, uh, that ether into um, various forms of staked ether in a way that's, you know, responsible and, and ensuring that, um, you know, there's a good diversification and making sure that some of these other liquid staking projects are receiving um, some of this volume. So, yeah, we're, um, we really have a great team that's focused on that. And I know it's uh, sort of the pride of the community. It's a wonderful resource that we, um, are pretty diligent about. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I think a lot of DAOs and I should take a look 
at how you're managing the treasury. Now, I want to wrap this up with, um, is there anything else on the future roadmap for Rook that people should be aware of that you'd like to share now? The future for Rook is huge because we're building something that every single person that uses a blockchain would be happy to use. Something where you just do what you're doing every day and money comes out of it. Money for you that you weren't getting before. And so the future for Rook is going to consist of this gradual expansion into different areas of DeFi until the hope is everybody is using Rook. Whether they think they are or not, it might be something that's not visible to them. It might be something their applications that they like are using under the hood or whatever, but they'll feel the effect of its, of its action. They'll feel the markets becoming more efficient. They'll feel the more money in their pocket. And they'll feel like it's easier to use the blockchain than it was before. And for builders, it'll feel easier to build protocols on the blockchain without having to worry about MEV, without having to worry about you know, value being siphoned uh, by stale quotes or by arbitrageurs or, or any of these kinds of problems. But what you're going to start to see over the coming months is as more and more of our partnerships start to come online, and as we start to introduce some new products that we're really excited about around and building on top of this protocol, new primitives that people can use and start to stir into their applications, I think you're going to see the application layer begin to recognize that it can become productive without actually changing much about what it happens today. And I think they're going to make that choice. And so we're focused on giving them the easiest decision they've ever made in their life, something that's going to be good for the network. It's going to be publicly accountable and transparent and run as a DAO. And it's going to pass them the absolute maximum amount of value that they could derive from their order flow. Yeah, me too. I mean, it, this is truly fascinating stuff. And we'll definitely do this again, take a bit of a deeper dive interview into what's going on at Rook once you launch some of these new features and get the word out there about this so so that users really understand what you're working on. But thank you so much, Hazard, for taking the time to do this. This was a super fruitful discussion. Thank you. It was a pleasure.